Well, so here we are. This is the Columbia campus there at the at the bottom. And over here is Avery Hall. Uh, Daniel was just mentioning it. There's at the bottom, you can see the main uh, kind of campus commons and around it are the various buildings of the different faculties. Um, so in the middle of the image at the bottom is a domed building reminiscent of the of the Pantheon in Rome, which was originally the library, but is now the president's office. And over to the right, you can see a little blue arrow, which is where the preservation program is. The architecture planning and preservation school is in Avery Hall, which is the building that you see at the top. And the school is spread out around a number of different buildings. And so is our program. And so when you get here, you will, you will get you know, really acquainted to it. But if you look at the bottom left-hand side, you can see a key map and the building that looks like a Greek cross, that's that domed building that we were just looking at in the in the plan, which is uh, low library, the, the original library. And then to the right, there are some buildings that are shaded black. And those are the buildings in which our school is. There, there are four in total. And so on the right, then you can see uh, above that and to the right, you can see some diagrams of that. And in blue, shaded blue, are the areas that are really the areas of the, of the preservation program. So uh, on in Avery Hall, there are our offices and also a lot of, um, of the classrooms in which you will be taking seminars and, and, and studying in different classes. We have lecture rooms at the bottom of the Avery Hall. There are the two auditoriums that where we have a lot of the big lectures. Um, so that's the, also the building that has the library, Avery Library, with some of the greatest, the world's greatest archival resources, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright's papers are here, McKinley and White's papers. So it's, it's really a tremendous resource for everyone in the preservation program. Then you have the building Fairweather Hall. That's our studio. That's our preservation studio. Everybody gets a desk there. That's kind of our home room where everybody uh, spends, um, you know, you take studio classes, but also where you just have your desk and you, you also hang out in off hours. And then in Shermerhorn Extension, that's where our preservation technology lab is. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. It's a major part of, of the program in its focus. We have a mix of full-time and, um, and uh, adjunct faculty in the program. Um, so some of the, we're three full-time faculty. Andrew Dolcard is a historian, focuses on New York City history. Um, he's published a number of books on New York City history, including books on tenement houses, books on the Columbia campus, and books on different vernacular typologies like the, uh, the Row House of New York City. He's also very involved in groundbreaking research on uh, LGBTQ sites. So these are sites associated with LGBTQ history that have um, that were really neglected and overlooked by preservationists and uh, Andrew, with a number of pres uh, alumni from the preservation program, started a, an organization to document them, create this tremendous online resource, and they're now uh, protecting them in, in various ways through the Landmarks uh, program. So uh, Andrew is someone that you will meet in Studio One. He is somebody that teaches archival and historical research methods. So it's this is something that's very important for historic preservation because sometimes, you know, buildings that are not necessarily beautiful might be very important because something uh, happened there that is worth uh, uh, our, our attention as a as as a society. So. Uh, in particular, the picture in the middle, for example, the Stonewall Inn, it's just a regular bar, pretty uh, nondescript building, but this was the site of the LGBTQ revolts um, that led to the passing of, of um, you know, civil rights protections for uh, gays and lesbians, and also the beginning of the gay pride parade and, 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 and so many other um, you know, world-changing events. So this building is protected not because of its architectural significance, but because of its social significance. And part of the way that you learn that is through archival historical research. So that's a major part of what it means to be a preservationist, and that's part of Studio One. 
Studio Two um, uh, is is run by Erica Avrami, and Erica Avrami is a planning uh, professional, a policy uh, uh, person, and really deals with more of the systemic issues of historic preservation, the kind of big picture. Um, the laws, the regulations that happen at all levels, from the municipal level to the national and international level. So she has, um, you know, decades of experience in the field, working for the World Monuments Fund as director of uh, education and research for the World Monuments Fund. Uh, also worked with the Getty Foundation and does these incredible studios that are. Uh, teaching students how to engage with communities and try to understand from the communities what their resources are, what's what's important to the community, and then from there develop policies in accordance to that. So um, you'll be meeting her in Studio 2. I should say, of course, that our studio is, is uh, not, sorry, our program is studio-centric and focused on experimental preservation. And so I um, we can talk a little bit more about what that means, um, but I would say that it's very creative, it's very artistic, it's very much focused on innovation. We, we believe that, you know, preservation is a way of changing the world, but also preservation is a way of making the future. So we're very much invested in this idea of testing out new ways to preserve and to think about the future through historic objects. And so that's, uh, uh, I'm the third full-time faculty in the program. Uh, here are some of my books that deal with this question of experimental preservation, which is, you know, this is a book that tries to capture this um, and, and shine a light on this, on this movement, uh, which is really, you know, although Colombia has played a lead role in it, um, it's really an international movement. Um, I've written his more history books uh, concerned with postmodernism and how architects became interested in history in, in, in the first place. And then a more recent book uh, that just came out um, is a textbook on historic preservation theory, which is really an anthology of original texts from all over the world um, that is used for teaching his, uh, the class historic preservation theory and practice, which I teach. Uh, first year I'm teaching now, and uh, so if if you come to uh, visit or come to study with us, you will you will take that class. So my practice, um, you know, I'm trained as an architect, uh, trained as a historian, trained as an urban designer, many many different kinds of trainings, um, and but that all led me to uh, historic preservation, and uh, always practiced as an artist. And so my practice really uses art as a way to preserve historic buildings and preserve aspects of historic buildings that are sometimes neglected. So I've done this um, decades long research on dust and the dust that settles on buildings and clean the dust with different techniques. Um, and then here you can see some of my artworks that have to do with latex, you know, pulling off the dust off of buildings with latex casts and then showing the dust on the one hand cleaning the building and on the other hand really showing this dust uh, as an artwork itself to try to think about dust as an important architectural material. This is not obvious to everyone, but you know, before you make a building, you have to make a lot of dust to make all those materials um, pollute. And so pollution is, is in a way the origin of architecture, but it never is accounted for as a material. So these, this is a project to really think about pollution as an architectural material. And so of course that leads us to the preservation technology lab and how we think about materials. And I'll talk about that in a second. But these works, the work of, of Andrew, Erica and myself have in common this idea of testing and questioning what a heritage building is, what heritage is, and how do we take care of it? You know, pushing the envelope, pushing the boundary of what can be considered heritage, why, for whom is it considered heritage, and how using the tools of preservation, we can actually begin to make a difference and change the world in the direction, in an intentional direction that we uh, want to see. And as a program, I would say that we're very focused on this question of climate change 
and of course, social justice together. So these are projects that, that really lead the way in, in that direction. Um, I also work on, um, on the preservation of uh, historic monuments around the world with teams. This is a project that I've uh, been working on to preserve the United States Embassy in Oslo, which was designed by Aero Saren, a very famous modern architect in 1959. I can tell you more about that project if you're interested. Uh, we have a tremendous group of um, adjunct faculty, all of whom have um, offices and studios in and around New York City. They are both, uh, they're from many, many different disciplines. Many of them are architects, many of them are engineers, some of them are historians, some of them are policymakers and planners, uh, some of them are conservationists and material scientists. Uh, some of them are data science engineers. Um, we believe that you know the material world and the technosphere are connected through data uh, and uh, digital information. So you, we have a, a lot of classes focused on machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, 3D scanning, all of which connect to material science uh, courses as well of different materials like stone or metals, things that, that make up architecture. But these are also of course connected to classes that deal with, uh, with policy. You know, How does the regulation and the laws that are created in different countries affect how we treat those materials? So for example, Carolina Castellanos, who you see on the right-hand side, is somebody that works with um, you know, UNESCO and other international organizations to uh, create management plans uh, at an international level. So public historians, I, I heard some of you are, are coming from that background, will be very interested in, in that kind of work. And this is all, you know, again, we all come from very different disciplines. And some of you are coming from architecture, some of you are coming from engineering, some of you are coming from history, English, philosophy, and that's part of what makes preservation amazing is that we, you know, we bring it all together. You met already Sarah Grace. Um, Mika uh, supports us with a, a, as lab manager, and uh, Lee Smith is our program assistant. Um, you have some options in terms of how you can um, register in the program. Uh, you can either be full time or part time. So. Uh, if you are coming full time, it's four semesters, so uh, two years with a summer in between. Um, really, it's it's geared for students who are coming from a career that is related to preservation, but want to make the shift into preservation and want to become professional preservationists. Uh, you don't really have to have any prior experience in preservation, or you can join the program as a far, part uh, part time student which is four years and you do it ha half time. So you're really taking um, uh, classes so that uh, on a half time basis so that you can actually be working in New York City uh, at the same time. So this is for people that have already some prior experience in preservation, architecture, engineering, or planning uh, and that are, um, that are working in the field and want to do the program uh, in that way. Some of you might be interested in our dual degrees, which we have with urban planning, with architecture and real estate. So you shave off and save some time in those dual degrees. And of course, if you some of you have questions about those, we can talk about those separately. Um, we Our program is quite unique uh, and our curriculum is quite unique. Um, um, we, we call it the slab curriculum. And the SLAB curriculum, uh, it has these four pillars that are integrated together across our curriculum. It's called the S stands for society, L stands for the laboratory, you know, preservation technology laboratory, A stands for archives and historical work, and B stands for building, building design. So now I've already talked about um, some of the ways in which these things come together. Now, uh, let me just make that a little bit clear. The way they come together is in studios. Studios, we have a studio every semester for the first three semesters and then followed up by a thesis the last semester, which is an individual project. Now, the studios are places where you do hands-on work and you're actually learning to integrate all of the knowledge from the SLAB 
curriculum into particular projects. And each of these studios places an emphasis on, on one or two aspects of these of these four facets of the of the program. So in Studio One, which as I already mentioned, is led by Andrew Dolcard, you'll be learning really about archives and historical research, but you're also going to be learning about buildings and some basics about how to analyze buildings graphically, how to design or understand design principles. Um, those of you that are architects or engineers will have more design work. Those of you that come more from a historical and archival background will have more of that work. So part of that studio is to put everyone on the same, you know, uh, collective work, but also to learn from one another. Studio two is more community based research, community engaged research. You're really going to be focusing on the S. Um, you're also going to be doing archival historical work and some design work as well. And then Studio 3, which I lead, is really an experimental preservation studio, which we work. It's a travel studio. We travel to different places. We're currently working in Venice. I just took the students to Venice. We spent a week there uh, and we're working on the adaptive reuse of a, of a historical building there for climate change. And so we're working with a community there with local partners to really understand how climate change manifests itself there and to really begin to design and think about an experimental preservation plan for that site. Another one of our studios, which is led by Erica, is dealing with the film industry and how the film industry uses historical site, in particular in Montgomery, Alabama, where a lot of the civil rights sites have been used for films. And so she's looking at the policy questions and the ethical questions of using films uh, in, in historic sites or filming historic sites. Now, these studios are really um, uh, supported by a number of seminars and lecture courses, which you can see below. And all of those are coordinated very tightly so that exercises that you're doing in one class is, are reverberating or being talked about in another class. And they're really kind of building up so they give you all the all the knowledge and all the skills that you need to be a professional preservationist and go out and get a job and, you know, make some money, which is part of the concern that everyone, you know, of course, has. This is Studio One. We go out on the street. We look around. We measure buildings. We go to archives. Um, we learn about the different building types of New York City, the different materials. Um, Studio Two is community engaged. We work around New York City. We interview people. We discuss um, the various issues that have, you know, influenced the development of the site. The values that have influenced the development of the site. Sometimes values are good. Sometimes are they're disagreeable. Like for example, the values of redlining that uh, really racialize the urban experience in New York is something we talk about. And how can we address it? How can we fix it through? Uh, both policy, but also different um, design interventions at the very local level that begin to highlight different aspects of the city. So on the right hand side, for example, uh, students did a, an installation uh, doing some history interpretation of these uh, very important churches in Harlem uh, that was open to the community. And on the left, um, this is a project that was actually for Columbia University to try to literally bring light to one of the buildings in, in Columbia University that is uh, where uh, uh, the LGBTQ movement in New York had uh, a, a major place of gathering. These were dances that were organized at Columbia University for all the New York LGBTQ community. Uh, and so the, the, the building is designated for having that history. Uh, studio three, we, we it's again a travel studio. Uh, when there was COVID, we, we, we stayed local, but now we're traveling again. This is a project, this is a studio that teaches you how to actually visualize those values at a building scale. How do you actually make, when you're preserving a building according to a set of values and ideas about how you want to engage with the community, think about the future, and think about the relevance of a particular site to that community, you have to make choices, you have to design you have to change materials. You have to put in a new entrance. You have to put in a visitor center. So how do you engage with the community and how do you begin to make those design choices? So this is a design, this is an experimental preservation design oriented studio. And here we worked with 
a very important site of one of the founders of the United States called John Jay, who was one of the people that uh, passed the laws to abolish slavery, but uh, he was paradoxically also a slave owner. So we dealt with some of those issues. Students go out and learn to 3D scan using drones, uh, using 3D scanners, using photogrammetry, make 3D models to visualize how to, for example, reconstruct buildings, and then take those uh, three-dimensional information and feed into them a lot of really specific, hardcore uh, lab materials analysis work on the paint samples, on the, on the wood types, et cetera, to be able to then you know, make a proposal for a reconstruction of a building, for example, among many things. This is a historic bowling alley, but that students were thinking about how to actually reconstruct it and turn it into something else. In this case, what the J Center needed was a visitor center. Um, so uh, we also uh, work a lot with 3D printing. You know, this is the future of bringing a hybrid of craft and digital technology together. So we 3D scan pieces of buildings that are decaying or that are um, that are uh, that need to be replaced, and then figure out how could we 3D print these pieces um, to replace them when the craft work is not there. A lot of time, the 3D print needs to be supplemented with some kind of craft technique. So, for example, this is the printout of some historic tiles in Spain that we worked on, but then need to be lacquered and um, and and fired. Uh, so that they have the right color on them. So that's um, some of that work. This is some, again, some of that Studio 3 work that we did working on different buildings around the world. That was the United Nations in Geneva. This is the U.S. Embassy in, uh, in uh, London. And you can see on the right, students also experiment with different ways of visualizing history. And so here, for example, the student on the right hand side, you can see was using an overlay of different images indicating different time periods and how those kind of that palimpsest of times then needs to be enacted and visualized in the final design for the adaptive reuse of the embassy into a new library for London. Uh, we did similar projects. We did this whole series on um, U.S. embassies around the world that are being closed and decommissioned. And so this was the one for um, uh, Mexico City, where students worked on uh, different systems um, to, uh, to adapt these buildings to climate change at the same time that they're being adapted to new, um, new programs and made public again. So you see the image on the right is the old embassy, and on the left is the student proposal. We were recently in Venice, and this is the, the team. We just got back from Venice. This is the US Pavilion in Venice, uh, currently by Simone Lee, um, who's done that intervention. Incidentally, the uh, you can see there's a thatched roof that has been placed in front of the historic uh, US Pavilion at the Venice uh, Biennale. That, that whole uh, thatch roof, which which is part of Simone Lee's artistic installation, was actually uh, designed uh, by a student that was once in the Historic Preservation uh, Studio Three, and uh, so we're very proud that that he did that. And actually, the U.S. Pavilion itself is also a uh, alumnus of the Columbia program, but from 1930. So you know, this has a lot of Columbia history in that photo. But we travel, we see how preservation is done in different countries. This travel, by the way, very important to mention, is funded by the school. So yes, the program is very expensive, but yes, the program also, you get a lot back. Uh, so the school funds you in different ways. This, this, these travel studios are, are funded by the, by the school. Uh, so we went to Frida Kahlo's home in Mexico City or to um, Teotihuacan. Students went to Africa as well, to Freetown and Sierra Leone uh, to, to work on some of the uh, remnants of the slave trade over there. They've been to Haiti, they, you know, they've, they've gone to Myanmar. So this is the pro this is this other studio that is done by Erica Avrami, who is a community engaged studio and does these incredible reports that are policy recommendations for the future. So the, 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 the project, the end, the end product over here is these, these, um, 
these reports that actually have a life in the world afterwards and are adopted by communities uh, in order to pre preserve some of these um, uh, resources. So now they are in Montgomery, Alabama. They just got back and they're again working, I mentioned, on how these sites are used in various films and they're engaged with a lot of communities there. So this brings me to thesis. So those are the three studios and you're going to be doing a thesis that is independent research. Now, these theses are really whatever you're interested in. Some of the theses um, are very materials oriented. Some of the theses are uh, tech, you know, digital technology oriented. Um, we have one student now dealing with blockchain technology. Um, other students um, dealing with vernacular architecture, archival work. Um, other, you know, there's they're really um, they span the full gamut of the program. You have at your disposal the Preservation Technology Laboratory, where you can have access to all of the equipment and materials to do scientific research on different materials. Here we have a student who was doing a project on uh, lime mortar, you know, how to find a good replacement for lime mortar. So we can, again, the thesis is a one-year project. We're very proud of our theses. This is, uh, we spend a lot of time with you working one-on-one -on, -one on your thesis. You get a thesis advisor that follows your progress, helps you along the way. There is a thesis class that helps you to frame your research question and uh, set yourself up with a literature review and, and uh, identify your archival and historical resources that you're gonna use in, in, as part of your research, the, set up your scientific experiments, set up your technological protocols. So all of this is really, um, really well organized. You get a lot of support uh, for this. You also get money to travel for your thesis research. So the, you know, we, will, we will support your travel. We want our students to change the world. We want our students to go out there, develop big ideas, to dream big at Columbia, and then take those ideas and actually make them happen. So uh, unique to our program is a major prize called the Onera Prize. And it's $25,000 for a student that graduates from Columbia University in historic preservation to take that big idea and make it real. And so you, you use these $25,000 for the six months that you that follow your graduation and come up with a with a with a you know implementation of that new idea. So we've had some students that have done, for example, uh, uses of augmented uh, reality to um, to to visualize what a restored building might look like. Um, they've actually started a company uh, and uh, these students are actually now teaching in the program. You know, they've, they've come back to the program. Uh, and other students that uh, were thinking about how to spatialize the history of Poughkeepsie, New York and allow the community to, to visualize um, where these historical sites are and, uh, and provided this incredible resource for Poughkeepsie to really master plan its, its future in relationship to its historic sites. 